the Operational Excellence Coach over at CMVP, the Columbus Mid-Range Engine Plant. And how many people are familiar with lean manufacturing? So what do you think of it? Stinks? I don't like it. Yes, sir. It's efficient. It's a mission? Efficient. Efficient? Okay, it can be sometimes. Anybody else? Just to give you some insight, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of history, who gets the credit for lean manufacturing in today's world? Who, who, who do you hear when you talk about lean manufacturing? Ford was his name that did the, uh, helped the Japanese after World War II. Um, Uno? Dr. Shingo? No, 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 no. The American that went over to Japan after World War II. Ah, Dr. Deming. Deming, yes. Okay, well Deming had a lot to do with quality and driving statistical controls and helping people to get out of offices and, and learn to see. But who was primarily the instrument in, in what we tend today to call lean manufacturing? Okay. It was a gentleman by the name of Uno. Okay, Taiichi Uno. Okay. And Taiichi Uno, uh, after the war in the World War II, he was given the task of rebuilding Toyota's automobile industry. He was a mechanical engineer and primarily did a lot of his uh, experimenting in machine shops. Uh, old Bridgeport, uh, grinders, lathes, uh, some old fashioned, what you would traditionally see in 1940s, 1950s machine shops, machining, anything from shafts, gears, uh, you know, those kind of components. Taiichi Uno uh, spent a lot of time over visiting somebody else in the States. Do you know who we might have visited? Ooh, you guys need a class in history. <laughs> so the gentleman they visited was Henry Ford. And Henry Ford was on the cutting edge in the early 1900s when it came to engineering. Okay, most people at that time, the, the automobile industry were, were backyard mechanics and they did it for either farming or they did it for automobile racing. Okay, and in the 1900s they were starting to build automobiles for the rich people and Henry Ford wanted to build it for everybody. Okay. And so Henry was a very big innovator, and he was looking for different things, and he was grabbing engineers. How many industrial engineers do I have? They're mechanical engineers. All mechanical engineers, okay? Industrial engineering is a lost art, and they're, they're worth their weight in gold if they're good. Okay, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, I'm not saying anything. But the flow of how people, machinery, and material all come together is an art. Okay? And there were great leaders like Gowitz. There was a husband and wife team. Frederick Taylor. You know, these were the early innovators that worked with Henry Ford. And these were the people that Uno saw early on and took to. Okay? About driving out waste. Uno brought Dr. Shingo in as they started going down the line because he wanted some education. And Dr. Shingo was being well known. Did everybody hear about Dr. Shingo? Anybody? Okay. Shingo was well known at that time for rebuilding the Japanese uh, trains that were decimated during the Allied uh, bombardments. And so he was transitioning their train stations and he was getting a, a notoriety. And so Uno asked uh, the HR director, Kido, to bring him in and start teaching his people industrial engineering. And this is where this primarily comes from, this seven forms of waste. Anybody ever hear of that? Seven forms of waste. It is what kills manufacturing because no one sees it. It's it's like it's like uh, you know you hear a carbon monoxide poison where you don't know it and then all of a sudden you're laying on the floor dead. You know this is the same thing that happens to manufacturing on some of these things that I'm going to show you. If you don't know it, all of a sudden you end up dead. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit and we're going to show you some videos. And the thing that I challenge you is, as an engineer, you know, I had a, a good friend of mine that once told me this is his frustration mainly with engineers was once we took all these bright young students and came out of college and put them in manufacturing, 
that they got bogged down in the everyday crap, okay? And therefore, therefore when they were stuck doing mund mundane type tasks to fix and repair instead of innovators, instead of people that were making the next level up, people that are taking cycle times off, people that were, you know, developing the new things, things that you went to school to do, okay? And so the challenge that you have when you get out into the real world is how do you utilize your maintenance people? How do you utilize your operators? And how do you transition your knowledge into them so that you can be the innovator and you can continue moving the product up, okay? Instead of getting bogged down and getting stuck and doing the everyday tax fix and repair, okay? So let's talk about seven forms of waste. What is value add? Anybody know what value add is? Value add is what the customer is willing to pay for. Form, fit, or function, something has changed. Okay? Anything other than that, the customer is not willing to pay for it. If Johnny goes to the bathroom, is the customer willing to pay for that? Johnny goes out to get a cigarette, is the customer willing to pay for that? Machine goes down, is the customer willing to pay for that? Machine is improper for the use that's needed. Is the customer willing to pay for that? No. And so these are some of those highlights that you see in manufacturing on a day in, day out basis. Value is change of form, fit, or function. Let's talk about waste, non value add. We break it into two elements non value add but necessary and strictly waste. Okay? Non value but necessary. What might you think that would be? How about I gotta get a bolt? I gotta get a bolt, okay? The bolt going in the engine is value add. But it isn't gonna go through there through os osmosis. You know, you, we are a gene, we can't blink our eyes and all of a sudden it's there. Someone's gotta go get it, okay? But that doesn't mean they have to go a country mile to get it, okay? And so these things we talk about non-value add if necessary. Okay, how about quality checks? Waste, value, non-value, but necessary. Value. Why? Because it prevents you from having to do more rework if the problem is found later. So you're a customer, you go to buy a flat screen TV, 55 inch, and it's $1,200. But on this side, the guy wants to sell you a flat screen TV for 3000 because he says it, the quality is just impeccable. And it's really, really good because we do all these quality checks. We do this, we do that. But when you see both TVs together, they're the same. Value add and non-value, which one are you gonna buy? The cheaper. <laughs> Why? We always buy the cheaper ones. So why do you think we put the quality inspections in? The long term. Long term? Yeah. Long term of what? Long term quality. Long term of quality. So you expect this product to be bad for a long time? Well, hopefully it's good for a long time. But I just asked you, why do you put the quality check in? Quality checks in themselves are waste. Why do you put have a quality check? Because your process is not robust enough. Wasn't designed properly. Okay? Could be the wrong machine, could be the wrong material. That's why you're here today to learn. Okay? But if you develop a process that needs quality checks and the process isn't capable of sustaining its own process day in and day out, then you've added waste into the process. And you've added more cost into the process. Now it may be necessary because your process isn't robust enough to protect you against the customer, but it's still waste. Make sense? Yeah, but it will be cheaper to have quality control than to pay insurances to damage people when you visit, maybe? But the issue is, the guy over here that's doing it for 1600, obviously, he's designed that product properly. His engineers have gone down through and done due diligence, and their processes are robust. This guy who wants to charge you 3000 because he has all these extra quality checks, he wants you to pay for his lack of engineering design. Quality may be the same when you look at it at the store, 
But it's a lot different when you have to fork over your wallet to take the product out, take your, your costs out. And, this and is, yet your opinion is going to change when the cheaper TV fails 30 sure, days out. Sure. It, you know, early on in my generation in the 70s, quality was something you bought. Mm -hmm. In other words, General Electric, mm -hmm. uh, Chevy, you bought quality in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Today, do you buy quality? No. It's a given. You can't even get in the marketplace without quality. Okay? You can't. It's a given. If you don't have quality, you're not going to have a product very long on the market. Okay? Nobody likes that answer. Okay? I tell the story. Okay? Anybody queasy? Okay. So I tell this story. I work in the plant. Okay? And I, I get there about 5 o'clock in the morning. I go home at about 4 in the evening. Okay? And when I get home, I got my computer and I'm trying to fill up some emails and I'm watching ESPN on the TV trying to get the, the scores of what's going on, kind of multitasking. And my wife has heard this new thing from Oprah that women like to say 20,000 words in the course of a day and she's trying to get them all said within the hour that I just got home. And so meanwhile, I'm sitting there going, yeah, 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 I'll just go, and she's fixing dinner and she brings over the dinner. Now we're having turkey. We're having mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans. I like that, okay? And so as I'm rat tat tatting, I got my fork and I'm starting to throw stuff in my mouth, not really paying, every now and then go, yeah, 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 and this is how this evening's going. All of a sudden, I feel something odd in my mouth, okay? I notice that I just poked the green beans. That doesn't feel like a green bean. It tastes like a green bean. And so as I pull it out of my mouth, across the table, my wife's in dry ease because she can see it faster than I can see it. i got to get my eyes adjusted. It's a rat's tail, okay? And she is dying across the table, okay? And after I take a good glance at it, I wasn't particularly fond of it either, but it was already done, so I put it down on a plate and washed my mouth out. But quickly thereafter, we took all those green beans, we threw them in the trash. What does that signal? Therefore, I, I don't trust their quality anymore. I've already been burned. I'm not eating another one of those canned green beans. I don't care if they're all perfect. I'm not. Quality is, is a given. If you don't deliver quality to me, I'm not buying that product again. Every time we went to the grocery store, we got different kinds of green beans, and slowly that product left that supermarket. Today, they don't even sell that product. Okay? Quality. You know, if you don't deliver quality, you won't be in business very long. Okay? All right, that being said. So, value add, non value add, and waste. Okay? Form, fit, or function. Okay? How do you change that process to give me something of value that I'm willing to pay my money for? Hidden waste, tool chain builders, or hidden waste. Necessary, but hidden waste. Inspections, waste. Parts handling, waste. Got to get there, because you can't build it without it, but it's still waste. Unavoidable transportation of parts, and rapidly purchasing parts. Minimizing these activities help you to reduce costs in manufacturing. So these were the seven ways that Uno and Taichi Uno discovered in the 1950s that hurt manufacturing. Transportation of material, excess inventory, waste of motion, Weighty, overproduction, overprocess, and defects. Okay? All right, so let's see what this looks like. Oh, I did, hold on. I didn't need that volume. Do you have the volume stored over here somewhere? Thank you.
profitability of a business. The processing of any good or service will contain waste. Reducing or eliminating this waste should be the goal of anyone who desires success. Taiyachi Ono, a mechanical engineer at Toyota Motor Corporation and the creator of the Toyota production system, knew that the most important step in the reduction of waste was to first identify it. Even though manufacturing and service processes may differ greatly from product to product and company to company, Ono was able to identify several fundamental kinds of waste that exist everywhere. Eventually, this list was condensed into seven main types. Before we fully understand the seven wastes, we must understand the defining characteristics of work. Taiyachi Ono identified two kinds of work, value-added and non-value-added. Value-added activities are those that tangibly change the end product in some way. The customer would see and recognize these changes as adding value to the product they are buying. Typically, only 10% of the work completed is value-added. All non-value-added work is categorized as waste, and it has two elements, necessary work and excess waste. Necessary non-value-added work is work that does not change the end product in any way, but is essential to the process. This includes elements like putting on protective coverings and other safety measures, checking plans, transporting product and process from station to station, and so on. Necessary non-value-added work can sometimes be reduced by rethinking and reconfiguring the process itself. However, it is much more difficult to eliminate than other wastes. Excess waste is the second part of non-value-added work. When first doing Kaizen, there will be easily identifiable waste that can be eliminated immediately. However, some wastes are much harder to identify and to see as they can be hidden. Take care to learn the seven wastes and be diligent in finding and eliminating them in your work processes. Reading your work processes of these wastes will improve your overall work performance and quality. The seven wastes are transportation, motion, weighting, over-processing, inventory, defects, and overproduction. <coughs> the first waste is transportation. Transporting a product or service has no tangible value. It's only a cost. Excessively moving a product or shipping a service can damage the product or diminish the quality of service. The transportation of a product also requires material handling, which add an additional organizational cost. Mapping the flow of products can help you visualize the process of transportation and will aid in the elimination of this waste. The second kind of waste is motion. Waste of motion is the excessive moving, bending, walking, and lifting of personnel while performing a task. Time spent moving unnecessarily is a waste and can also represent health concerns as well as safety issues. Motion can be addressed by analyzing and redesigning the work environment so that excess motion can be reduced. The third type of waste is weighting. Whenever a good sits without being usefully moved or processed, it represents the waste of weighting. A large quantity of the time lost in producing a good or service is lost waiting for some step in processing. Time is money, and leveling production and creating flow in processing can help reduce wait times. Processing, or over-processing, is the fourth kind of waste. This variety of waste occurs when complex methods of processing are used when a simpler, less expensive alternative would suffice. Waste and processing can compound the other wastes, creating more steps in order to deal with the already existing issues. <coughs> leveling work, investing in flexible equipment, and creating manufacturing cells are important components to shrinking the waste associated with processing. The fifth kind of waste is inventory. Having an unnecessary surplus of work in process and final goods creates costs in multiple ways. Excess inventory requires storage space, handling, and represents unused material costs. Waste due to inventory is connected directly to overproduction and weighting. Excessive inventory can be reduced by creating more seamless flow between workstations and aligning production to tack time, which signifies the pace of customer demand. The sixth kind of waste is waste due to defects. Defects in either product or service directly affect the bottom line and represent a tremendous cost to organizations. The longer a defect is in the process of manufacturing, the greater is its ultimate. Automation and Pokeyoke measures will help eliminate defects during the manufacturing process. 
Reduced and open production, transportation, and inventory will help eliminate defects that occur from damage while being moved and stolen. If allowed to enter the marketplace, defects have a negative effect on customer service and consumer confidence. If customers don't have faith in the quality of a product, they are much less likely to purchase and may discourage others from buying as well. Just look at Toyota. Their sterling reputation was severely tarnished in 2010 when they had to recall vehicles due to the gas pedal sticking. It took them several months to regain consumer confidence after that debacle. The seventh fundamental kind of waste and the worst is overproduction. Overproduction is the creation of a product or service before it is actually needed. Overproduction is the most costly kind of waste because it amplifies all the others. It can lead to diminished quality and productivity. It can also cause excess inventory, higher storage costs, and can make it difficult to detect defects. Overproduction can be stopped by simply pulling the plug on production. Don't worry, waiting is the least dangerous waste. Slowing down the production process is better than overproducing. Overproduction can be avoided by scheduling and producing only what can be immediately shipped and sold. These seven basic wastes must be reduced or eliminated in order for a business to realize its full potential. To do this, recruit every employee to be a Kaizen warrior and listen to their observation and suggestions. As they are the ones performing the work every day, they are the most qualified to identify and eliminate waste. Implement a Kaizen system where employees can share and discuss their ideas for improvement and create Kaizen teams whose sole function is to implement these ideas and eliminate waste. Any questions on that? I'm going to show you a couple quick videos from Cummings. You tell me what you see.
Okay? Again, who designs these? This one was in a Toyota plant. Okay? So, and they will tell you, we're not perfect. We're con The difference between what Toyota would say them and us is the fact that they're constantly driving to get this stuff out because they've got eyes trained to see this kind of stuff. Okay? Tell me what you see. Yeah. 
It's so why, why are we not doing that? What, what is, what's holding us back? I think there's a couple things that holds us back. I think understanding this education that we just put you through. I think the other thing is that of people on my side of the fence, it's the management side, we spend too much of our time in offices and on what we call the other side of the glass wall. And we don't go out and respect our operators and don't go out and ask them whether they battle the beach and every day. You know, and, but from the operator standpoint, when I go coach and teach, you're still expecting entitlements. You're still expecting that you can walk away from the line and go do this or go do that. And you know, this is a constant battle between both forces and both of them are, are in the wrong. And so what we try to do is bring those two forces together. You understand on the op labor side that it's no longer about entitlements. It's about understanding you're the expert. We gotta treat you with respect and we gotta understand what you do each and every day and we greatly appreciate it. Management's gotta be humble and we gotta come out on the shop floor. What is your name, ma'am? Kelly. Kelly. Kelly, you were supposed to do 40 this hour. How many did you do and how can I help you? Okay, instead of us sitting on the other side of the glass wall throughout the course of the day, and then we come out and say, Kelly, how, how'd you do? And you go, well, I struggle all day. And they go, well, put all the blame on you. Well, you're just a terrible operator and you probably went through many breaks and da da da. And they just get worse and worse and worse. It, it's got to be a group effort. You know, it can't just be one side or the other. We can't make operators work harder, processes don't work. We can't make engineers go out and dummy everything down so operators can't be true craftsmen because that puts too much downtime in processes because it's constantly down because, you know, it has its own issues. So both groups have to work together. We don't do a very good job, to be honest with you. But I tell you, once it does start working together, wow, is it awesome. It is awesome. There's a lot of pride you know, on both sides of the fence. The engineers, you guys are now working on innovative stuff to make us even faster, better. The stuff you went to school with, the operators now have a greater appreciation and respect for what they do. They're back being craftsmen in the 50s when people used to carry around calipers in their back pockets and they knew exactly what the measurements were. They knew if they had quality or not quality. They could tell you if the machine was getting ready to go bad or you know, where it was at in the process because they cared and, and they drove that home. But you can't care about something if you're the only person caring. If the whole team doesn't care, then you quickly stop caring. And that's what's happening in manufacturing. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. I just kind of uh, thinking, how do you find this balance between making an employee comfortable mm -hmm. on the floor, producing something, and not stressful from uh, management, mm -hmm. uh, supervising for like this doing something mm -hmm. non-stop yeah. and quality of product. Right. And I heard some very ugly stories, uh, one of the companies, that uh, how people treated there, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, you you still have to find a balance between make people happy mm -hmm. doing what they do because it's your production also right. depends on that. Right. And another side to be very cautious about your quality and your how you do find how would you suggest to find the balance? I don't know. I, I think there's a couple things. In World War II, when our men left manufacturing to go fight the battlefront on both sides, okay, it left a vacuum in manufacturing. In, the, uh, the people from academia came in and said, mainly old engineers and old process engineers, they came in and said, this is the best way to do manufacturing. And we had a new group of employees. We had women that had never been in the factories before. We had handicapped that had never you know, been in the factory before. We had older folks who couldn't lift and, and strain, and they were coming into the manufacturing. So we had a select group of people that under normal standards, you would not think that that would work. But they had the highest productivity and the highest quality that of any generation of manufacturing even stands up today in, in it's just hard to match. So what made that stick out? And we call that PWI, training within the industry. So your point is how do you get there? And, and a lot of that is training. Tra we train the operator on new expectations. We train management. If you come to our plant, we, to be a supervisor, you have to spend five weeks with operational excellence. We teach you how to ask the proper way. We teach you how to work with teams. We, we bring the teams together and they work together, putting the engineers in management. Now, I will tell you, getting engineers to come to the party sometimes is like pulling you know, wild animals. 
okay, because it's just something new for you, okay? But man, you, you know, most of the time you'll hear, I'm sure you've heard Andy, and, you know, you'll hear, man, I come in here and I work 24-7 and my, my life sucks and this is a terrible job, I get paid good money, but, you know, it's just really, really hard. And it's because you try to do everything yourself. If you get more people involved and, you know, more heads in the, the pot, and you're just using your expertise to tweak, all of a sudden you're making that operator that much smarter and better. You're making the manager that much smarter and better. Okay, does that replace you? No, but you strengthen the team and the team gets better. And in turn, you're not doing nearly as much stuff as you were doing before. Okay, does that help? Okay, if, are we there? No. But, but I would highly recommend you come over and walk see the kids. So what do you think about it? When was the last time you were there? I actually don't job shop. See, I don't work for no longer at CV. I'm in the materials engineering apprenticeship. Okay. And I work at the tech center. And I love it because I actually get to work one-on-one -on -one with my engineers. And I understand and learn every day from them. But before I left CEP, I did job shadow um, CEP to try to help Kaizen, the heavy-duty machine lines, block heads. Um, and then soon before I left CEP, Mike Warner was now in charge. That CEP and the from what I hear, they're, they're going that way. So okay. it's nice to hear that, but from being an operator years ago on that line, it was just frustrating that it was, here's the numbers, get your numbers, but there was, you never seen management out. I mean, they didn't come out and talk, and when something was wrong, it was always yeah. felt like a finger pointed at the operators. Right. And it's got to change. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're all about, something to change. And if you're a supply engineer, we're looking for supply engineers, we're re-engineering the supply chain in our plant from scratch. And so there's a lot of neat stuff that's going on in our plant with packaging, with you know, blowing material quantity. The sky's the limit. There's a young lady, Anna May. Uh, do you know her, Anna May Hanson, I think? Mm -hmm. She's, a, she's a, a supervisor over in that area. She'd love to sit and talk if you've got an interest there. Because we're just breaking all the rules. Uh, we're re-engineering everything. Nothing is, there's no sacred cut. Uh, equipment, uh, you know, material, processes, standardized work, combine, e everything is re-engineered uh, with, with the standpoint of people coming together and saying, what's the best way that we can do this? And that's, that's what we try to do. How about transportation over sea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, transportation over sea, you know, transportation, big waste, so now we find some ah. in China. So, yeah, and this is where, in the supply chain, I get real upset. And, and there's a cartoon we have, and it's firemen, and they're over here at this building, and this building's on fire, and the lady jumps out, and she hits the trampoline that the firemen are holding, and they shotgun her over to this building, and this building's on fire, too, okay? And so when I look at the supply chain, that's what we do. You know, the purchasing guys say, I'm going to go to China, and they're buying this thing for, you know, three cents less, okay? But, you know, it's going to have to come in a big container of 60,000 of them instead of my money. Then i got to store it in a warehouse and buy equipment and do all the... This is what we've gotten in our supply chain now, okay? I think early on, in the 70s and 80s, we did it to develop countries so that we could put assembly plants and we had a nice little core of supply chain inside the, the main company that built parts. So it made sense developing a supply chain where today it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense when you've got all the turmoil you've got to strike on the west coast of the longshoremen and all of a sudden you can't get material and you've got to fly it in. All of a sudden the supplier's got a bad part. Now you've got three months worth of material that's on the water and you got all the stuff that's in your warehouse, you know, and, and all these extra costs. And by the way, who's going to pay for that? Is it going to be the supplier that's over in China? No, because he's probably hanging on by a thread to begin with. That's the reason why I gave it to you so cheaply. Okay? And so now you're the one that's going to be counting. What about all the logistics costs? What are, again, the equipment costs, the people costs. It, it's just massive. Supply chain is an exciting field to be in today because there's, the, the sky's the limit. You're at the bottom. Okay? You're re-engineering, rebuilding it from scratch. So that's, that's what I think about. I, I would try to develop around the area where I couldn't. I would work with my office supplier to 
the warehouses and bring those components in and, and have a joint effort that way. Yes, sir. Uh, it's interesting to notice that one of the things that you talk about is shortening the transportation routes mm -hmm. and um, and not storing things for the large amounts of time. And this is what is in some companies is called just in time. Mm -hmm. And this is a sea change, a reversal of where we've been for the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. I came out of General Motors where we moved everything that used to go on in Anderson, Indiana to Mexico. Right. Absolutely everything, 18 plants. I mean that, 18 complete plants right. closed. I was there when there were 50 plants in Anderson, Indiana. Right. I was a superintendent of plants of 17 in, uh, in okay. the components division in Anderson, Indiana. Okay. I was also uh, an ops manager at the starter motors of heavy duty and alternators and uh, light duty, heavy duty, light duty, and alternators when we were in Anderson, Indiana. And I totally agree with you. The General Motors mindset was stack it high and bring it off, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll, don't stop until we tell you to stop. That was our mantra. Uh, I was in Plant 23 when that whole that whole operation changed. But it just changed too too slowly, and before long, again, you're not going to pay three thousand dollars for a flat screen TV when the guy over here's got it for twelve hundred. You're just not going to do that. And it finally caught up to GM, so much so in 2008, they almost lost the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a lot of it is exactly what you're saying. There's a tremendous amount of change in, in this, uh, so much so to the point, I have a friend who's a truck driver, and I heard from him the other day, he's hauling a load out to California, and he's got a 15 or 30 minute window to reach the dock mm -hmm. at the plant where it's supposed to be. Yep. If he doesn't hit that window, yeah. it winds up coming out of his pocket right. in some ways. Right. And when you talk about rebalancing the supply chain and how we do all these things, and of course I work for somebody else, never mind I, that here. I thought that when you get in there. <laughs> You're a supplier of ours, so I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a great partnership with you yep. guys. but. Um, it's just interesting. I've seen a lot of the changes in General Motors, and I've seen a lot of the changes in the company I work for. And we hear sort of anecdotally about how thing, how great things are over at Cummins. <laughs> no, no, no. And so it's it's very very interesting to see this from a different angle. Yeah. And to see the change historically over time as to what's happening. I don't know where this is going, but it's either way, it'll be interesting. Here's what I say about Cummins. I, I say we've got the best research and development group anywhere, bar none. R&D can't touch us. Can't touch us. I happen to believe in the workforce. I think in Columbus, Indiana, we've got one of the best workforces that I've ever been around in 30 some years of doing this kind of work. Okay, just flat out awesome if you give them the opportunity. I think the challenge for Cummins will be to break down silos and, and, of expertise. In other words, when you look at the supply chain, purchasing just takes care of purchasing. Logistics just takes care of logistics. Uh -huh. Warehousing just takes care of warehousing. And how do you form, put all those groups together and you optimize the whole supply chain through the plan for every part. And you visualize a, a plan of the most efficient way, irregardless, if one group is a little bit off and the other, you look, you measure the whole, not the sub, you know, units. Same thing goes with manufacturing. The operator, management, engineering, material, you can't look at one. You gotta look at it as a whole, okay? Uh, and I think that will tell the tale. So we have some strong assets. We have some very high liabilities, okay? And I think we've got to change to meet the future. And if we do, then the sky's the limit because, again, we have the best R&D, bar none, and we've got an awesome workforce. Okay. And great quality. And great quality. And, and it's interesting because the, when you talk about trying to get plants and everybody to be on the same page and to be happy with the changes that are happening, that's a, that's a lot for some people to swallow. Yeah. It's interesting. We had a great year last year uh, 
in CMEP, probably our highest variable comp we've ever received. We, we had great records in quality, delivery, uh, inventory, term, everything was great. Our safety was a, was a little out of the boat, uh, but a lot of that stemmed from the year before, and we're just trying to get caught up. But you know, one of the things that we challenged our team with is, even though you had a great year, you still left somewhere around 50 to $75 million of opportunity on the shop floor. How do we know that? That's all that lost revenue that you were capable of producing, but you didn't. You didn't because the machine was down. You didn't because it took you too long to change the tools. You didn't because there was absenteeism. The, the reasons are multiple. The, the things that I just showed you today, all those things chew into your productivity and your cost. If we don't understand that, and as a group, engineers, operators, management together to drive that out, we won't be able to compete in today's world. We just won't, okay? Because Johnny over in China is making a fraction of what you're making, okay? Uh, uh, Ricardo down in Mexico, and this is, if you go down to Mexico, they're really grasping this quickly because they've had the 70s and 80s where everything went to Mexico. Okay, and now they're losing work to China and India and Vietnam because it, labor is not the only cost. Material is a cost. Waste, all these things are costs. And so this is the reason why I say that Americans can be competitive. We can be more than competitive, but we've got to drive this crap out of our business. Okay, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. What force development for advanced manufacturing so, um, recent reports of uh, labor statistics, Department mm -hmm. of Labor Statistics, they basically say in crime, how bad is uh, not, uh, not sufficient in average mm -hmm. picture uh, labor skills nationwide mm -hmm. for advanced high tech uh, industries to mm -hmm. what it should be. Uh, in different states, different situation, but uh, many of them just suffering of not enough good people prepared right. now. Right. So how comments make a deal with that? I mean, and what is your criteria for people who go into the floor, I mean, operators, or yeah. uh, what is your situation, I would say, here? Mm -hmm. I know many of you maybe know it, but still. Um, people from the street coming from Baton School Corporation, mm -hmm. maybe some, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to you, knocking the door, saying, hey, I want to work in the Cummins. I am 19 year old, so what's wrong? I think Cummins right now, in our temples, we have a lot of people that come in now that want to work, okay? Um, go through the temporary process and get a job. I think the hardest for most people is, you know, the millennials, you know, your attention span is not the greatest. Let's be honest, okay? You want to change the world. Okay? And so in that wanting to change the world, if you're putting widget A and widget B together for, you know, seven or eight hours a day, that becomes mundane for you and you're going, ah, I gotta go do something else. What we do in the plant is we give you a different opportunity. Okay? What we mean by that is we have little small teams that are constantly working. These millennials come together and so are you improving quality? You improving safety? You improving efficiency? We try to tap into that, that energy level that's not being tapped into so that you want to stay coming and you want to take pride in your work and, and you want to feel like you've done something, okay? And so that's one avenue. I think you're going to have to do more. Cummins is going to have to get into school systems and start having to look at people and see an engineer in third grade and see a, you know, a, a industrial engineer in fourth grade, you know, it's gonna have to be that kind of, you know, looking and developing, you know, people like they do in Europe. In Europe, you're developing young kids that come out of high school for, you know, careers in engineering and in careers in, you know, additional education and type things. And so there's this group effort that's, that's trying to feed the process. I think something like that will have, will be something we'll have to do in the future. Did that help you? Or else it'll we'll just it'll all go by the wayside. Yes. It's gonna take that energy book. You guys ask questions because you have to respond what you agree and disagree. If you I don't care anywhere, I'm talking. If he's talking. So you need to say something. It's your say, your yes, sir. Do you believe in climbing corporate ladder anymore with this new mindset? 
As you know, that, that's interesting. I, I came out of the Navy, I'm retired Navy, and I got recruited by General Motors in the early 90s uh, and got sucked into that menagerie and, and climbed that chain and went off and got my bachelor's and got my master's and with, with the whole mindset of climbing. I, I'm not there anymore. My mindset is about how I develop and, and how I shape you know, young minds, women, men, of how to help. So, no, it's not a corporate climb ladder for me. It, the value is the people in my team that grow and get better. You know, I take a lot of pride in, in our plant when we make new plant managers. People come to our plant and, and pick guys to be plant managers. That's that's a big plus for me. That, that's what I, I want. Okay. okay. back in the process. 
You're an operator. Wouldn't you love to have that opportunity to say how it should be that? Years ago, I would have loved it. Yes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm an operator now. And yeah. <laughs> so. Great. Any um, questions? Yes, sir. Question I got in that process where you're talking about, yes, you go to the operator and say, okay, help us fix this. Yes, sir. Have you ever had that backfire? Meaning the operators take it the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. And the backfire <laughs> tends to be, I've got four here, you three like it and you don't. And so, but you're the team coordinator or you're the main dog on campus per se, you know. And so you're fighting it tooth and nail and you're getting disgruntlement with these guys and so it, it can create a I'm even more backfire for the engineers. So they all agree that it works great, but it was the engineers and the engineers kind of backfire. So this is what we saw. We saw the engineer when we first started, uh, some engineers, not all, but some process engineers said, we don't like that, the way you guys are doing that. We think we should tell you what to do. And so therefore, we're just gonna put our initials and not even check anything. Well, there were a couple of process steps that weren't right. They were, you couldn't build an engine that way and, and not have quality defects, okay? And if, if it wasn't for some of our senior employees that were there saying, well, you can't do this. Even though majority rule said this was a better way to do it, I'm telling you, it, it, you're going to have NIBS issues. NIBS is a standard that we can go by. And you're going to have NIBS issues. And so I take it back into engineering and say, please review this and tell me if I've got issues. And they come out and say, yeah, you can't do this. And then I take it back and say, then why did you sign? You know, you have a responsibility in this process. Why didn't you sign it? Okay? Well, well, we, you know, we just didn't care. You know, we don't like you. Those guys. That isn't, we're not building a world-class process. Yeah, that's now, I will tell you that's drastically changed. And the whole group has changed and everything's changed. And now we've got the, the big, more unity in what we do. That's pretty tough. Pretty tough. Yeah, it, like I said, there is, the only thing short of this is peanut butter and chocolate. When those two things come together, it's flat out awesome. Whenever you get <laughs> operators that really, really get it, you know, and, and you give them a chance and you empower them and you put a support staff around them that engineers know their role, management knows them, that's as good as it gets, folks. That's as good as it gets. And it is flat out awesome. It just doesn't happen that often. And that's the reason why we need it. You know, this new blood that's coming in, don't go out on the shop floor thinking you know everything. Go out there with the understanding of learning from the people that are around you, okay? They worked on that machine, or they worked on that line for 20 years, okay? They're a valuable asset. And if, if they believe in you, that you respect them, your life is gonna be peachy, okay? If they don't, your life is gonna suck, okay? I'm just telling you, you're gonna be 14 hours in a plant, okay? No one likes that, okay? Alrighty. All right. I appreciate the chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you.